Susan, where did your Japan journey start? Well, this is going to sound kind of weird, Yoko-san, but it actually started in Europe. A single moment of curiosity can lead to unexpected opportunities, some ending in a lifelong involvement with Japan. Our conversation partners all have a unique Japan journey to tell one that's steeped in connections that have enriched their lives and altered them in deep, meaningful ways. Join us in their Japan journey and be inspired to embrace what's unfamiliar. Your next single moment of curiosity could lead you to possibilities you've never dreamed of. This is My Japan Journey. I'm Yuko Honda from the Japan Society of Boston. Welcome, Susan Napier. Thank you. Susan Napier is the Goldweight Professor of Rhetoric and Japanese Study at the Tufts University.、Um, it's great to have you, Susan. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Very kind of you. So, I am going to、uh, start right away and ask you, Susan, where did your Japan journey start? Well, this is going to sound kind of weird, Yoko san, but it actually started in Europe.、Uh, kind of the law of unintended consequences. I was just thinking about it. My parents were both academics,、uh, they taught at Harvard. My mother was an art historian. And、uh, when I was 10, they went to, to Germany and brought me along and sent me to a German school for a year. And my mother dragged me to, or from her point of view, she was trying to cultivate me and make me a sophisticated cosmopolitan person. But she, she dragged me to、uh, cathedrals and museums and all kinds of cultural stuff like that. And I hated it. I just hated it. It just seemed all old and, and kind of heavy and dark. And, and even when it wasn't dark, like Versailles, I really hated it because it just was so sort of. Uh, alien. And so my parents just kind of gave up and thought, oh, well, you know, <laughs> she's just going to be a Philistine. And then we got back to Cambridge and we were having lunch at this、um, Chinese restaurant in Harvard Square, which is still there. And I saw this scroll on the wall of, you know, a kind of pretty pagoda with cherry blossoms or something. And I said just spontaneously, oh, that's nice. My mother pricked up her ears because she heard, hadn't heard me say anything nice about an art object my whole life. This one is about 12.、Uh, and she said, Well, if you like that, I can take you to a place that's even better. And she took me to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And that's really where the journey began. I loved the Japanese landscape paintings and the,、um, and the woodblock prints. I just totally fell in love with this beautiful. Clearly, very rich, very interesting, very sophisticated culture that was also, I actually felt comfortable in it in a way that I didn't feel comfortable looking at a, at a European painting with a lot of, of human beings, you know, angels and stuff and pink flesh and everything. Instead, in, in the Japanese paintings, you'd have mountains and clouds and, and a stream and maybe a few people just kind of enjoying themselves against this background, but kind of being part of a larger natural world. And I just felt Well, yeah, I, this, is, this is great. I feel good here. And so、um, that's really how it started. And then I, I've also I had a friend in、um, uh, sixth and seventh grade who was Japanese American. And I、uh, was saying to her, Oh,、um, I'm reading haiku because I also I picked up a little haiku book at the museum. And I thought I was very proud of myself to be reading haiku.、And、she said, Oh, it's not any good unless you read it in Japanese. I thought, Well, okay, I guess I better learn Japanese. So, a couple of years later, I was in another school, a, a small girls' school in、um, Cambridge called Buckingham. It's now Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols. And I was talking to the head, a woman named Mrs. Stowe, and I said, Well, you know, I'd really like to take, and I remember my conversation with Margaret, Japanese. And she said, Fine. I still remember those days of learning, and it was terribly exciting. You were kind of learning all these new things, like even the A, what kind of said, yes, I don't understand. And you learned that yes has a different way of being used in Japanese culture. Just, you know, on the first page, you're already learning these really interesting cultural details as well as linguistic ones. Then Mrs. Stowe had this great idea. She said, 
you know, we send a lot of people to Paris um, for, you know, senior year. Why don't you go to Japan for a year? I ended up going to a school called Nichibei Kaiwa Gakuin in Yotsuya in Tokyo. And it's that's Japan English, Japan American uh, conversation school. And mainly it was to teach English, but they had a small Japanese program there. And at that point, I didn't have a high school diploma because it was my senior year. So I couldn't go to a college like Sofia or Waseda. So I went to Nichibei and that turned out to be really fun. Uh, there were only about five or six other students in my class and they were all much older and really interesting people. There was, um, an American traveler. We used to have travelers back then, kind of a hippie who was going around the world. And we had um, uh, a Thai, a man from Thailand, young man from Thailand who was a film uh, director. And my best friend turned out to be a, um, a Dutch woman who um, actually had her MA in linguistics from University of Leiden in, in the Netherlands, but had kind of been a traveler herself and been traveling around the world. And she was wonderful. She was so just kind of interesting and very, very smart. And uh, to, to kind of uh, summarize things quickly, I was living with a Japanese family, but eventually we did not work out. And they said, um, you need to leave. And so she helped me get a job at uh, Nippon Daiyaku Igakuin, the medical school at Japan University. And this is when you were seven, 16, 17. Yeah, 17. I just turned 17. Yeah. And so I would go out and, and kind of talk English for like an hour in front of the, these, you know, medical students. And then I also got a job at a kind of fly-by-night um, English language conversation school. It was a uh, school that advertised itself by saying it had only women teachers. In fact, the uh, advertiser was something like charming and no, it sounds really awful, but it really wasn't that bad because actually a lot of um, mothers and children uh, really preferred that because they were afraid of these big, burly, you know, Americans. And so I had a very varied student body and uh, that was really, that was nice. And um, yeah, so I ended up living on my own. I found my, um, the real estate agent found me a lovely little apartment uh, outside of Shibuya for a couple of months. I was on my own and, you know, um, supporting myself. And I didn't have a lot, lot of money, but I had enough. I remember the first month I ate a lot of eggs and rice. Um, and I was still going to Nichibei, so I was learning Japanese and um, teaching English. And it was the best year of my life. I mean, I had such a wonderful time. But Susan, it it's not just a Japan journey. I mean, living on your own at 17, making, you know, supporting yourself, meeting all these non-high schoolers. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Is is just an amazing story in itself. It was, it was really amazing. So this story leads me to ask you, take us when you actually decided to come back. I mean, I'm going to assume that there was an end date that you had to come yeah. back. Yes, actually, I love Tokyo so much um, that I thought I want might go on and, and go to like ICU, International Christian University or something, because I really, really liked it. And I was fascinated by the culture and wanted to learn more. But in the fall, I'd applied to two universities, Yale and Harvard. And I thought, oh, well, I probably won't get into either of them. So great, I'll be going to ICU. But then I did get in. But I think at that point, I was a little bit, you know, missing, you know, my, my furusato, my Cambridge and all that. Right. So that September, you started at Harvard. Yeah. I had a great time as an undergraduate at Harvard. I think having been on my own, you know, I was pretty relaxed. All these fascinating, you know, Harvard students. And I had a great roommate whom I'm still very, very fond of. She was from Iran and she had lived all around the world. Do you think, um, it was Harvard that kept your interest in Japanese? Because there are a lot of people who are really affected by their experience in Japan, but mm -hmm. choose not to take the Japan career path. They don't major in Japanese. They end up majoring in something else. This was a year that economics was very big at Harvard, and a thousand students were taking something called Ec-10. And so I say, oh, economics, this sounds exciting. And I really thought I would do Ec-10 and economics in Japanese, because also at that time, uh, this was when Japan was hot in terms of business and everyone was just starting to get on the japan japan train and so i thought all oh, right yeah i'll do japanese and economics and however i flunked 
really flunked my first exam in Act 10. So I struggled through economics and got the worst grades of my life. And then I thought, you know, really, I don't think I'm going to do um, economics. And, and there was a kind of choice between doing a more uh, very, very cultural, literary um, uh, kind of degree, uh, which was known as East Asian Languages and Civilizations, or doing a more sociological, more more contemporary degree, which was East Asian Studies. And everyone said, oh, Susan, you love literature, you should go into EALC. But I thought, no, I, I really believe that literature is part of a, a big continuum that, you know, it's, it's in, infected and impacted by what's going on around us. And I, I really want to know more about what, what's happening in the world. And also, Ezra Vogel was in charge of East Asian Studies, and I already was very, you know, reverential towards him. I thought, yeah, you know, I should I should go with, in that one. And it was, I, I never regretted it. Um, in graduate school, there was a period about 10 years when people were saying oh you know you don't care about the author you don't care about the culture you just need to do the text and I always thought that's that's ridiculous there's so much the text is related to so many other things and you have to know about language and culture and history and society and things like that so yeah that was probably my, my biggest choice and and then in the end I, I got married and I didn't go to um uh, into diplomacy and somehow or other maybe having both parents who had PhD sort of, you know, pushed me or led me into becoming an academic. So talking of you as an academic, you are very well known for your deep knowledge of anime. So far, none of anime have showed up in your stories. Where did that intersection happen in your life? Actually, that was quite a lot later. I mean, my first love was haiku. Um, I really love the imagery in haiku poetry, so beautiful. And then, then my next love was, was literature in general. And I read uh, Yukiguni Kawabata Snow Country in high school and remember feeling like, wow, this is really different. I really like this. It's a, just such a beautiful novel. That may have made me kind of more willing to accept anime. I find this sometimes a little difficult to talk about because I started in literature and that was fine and everyone said, yes, good good girl. And I wrote on uh, Yukio Mishima and Kensaburo Oe. And, but then I started going into fantasy. Doing fantasy, I became aware of manga. And because my students were reading manga, and I thought, gee, um, was that kind of interesting? Again, the imagery was really striking. And then I ended up in London, at University of London. I was teaching over there for a couple of years at, at SOAS, um, School of Oriental and African Studies. And, you know, I was, I was aware of this manga called Akira, because it, it really had struck me. A student had shown it to me, and I just thought, wow, this is, this is a dark interesting, complex work. And as it happened that um, I think the next year, the, the year after I arrived in London, the Institute of Contemporary Art in London had a showing of the first ever European showing of the movie, the animated movie version of Akira. It is just a powerful, propulsive, kinetic piece of, of um, a two-hour, almost two-hour long animation that brings in dystopias, politics, Apocalypse, uh, a very heartrending uh, story of, of friendship, uh, just amazing work of art. It is absolutely a masterpiece. And it has also, the last half hour has the most grotesque, most visceral, most upsetting scene I've ever seen in my life. I mean, to the point where I was kind of kind of hiding under my, my chair. I mean, it was just like, whoa, I didn't know they could do that. And, you know, if you're used to Disney movies, which are very pretty and charming, Akira was sort of like, oh, my gosh, they are going into places I never imagined. And then I, I really got lucky again. Um, some friends of mine were decided to organize a um, the first ever conference on Japanese popular culture in America. And we also showed Akira in, in Berkeley at the conference that spring. And the reaction was very interesting because... Half of the people who were older than I was, I was very young at that time in my um, very early 30s, um, and half of the people who were older than I just hated it. They just thought it was revolting, and this was not their Japan. This is not their Japanese culture. How, how dare this animation balderdash come in? They were really openly hostile. <laughs> it was quite interesting. And the other half, people around my age or so, were a bit more kind of, maybe a bit skeptical, but, but curious. And they knew that their students were interested. 
And they thought, you know, at this point, we want to bring in more students. Maybe, you know, can you, can you write this up? And so um, wrote it up and um, it appeared in a journal, uh, the Journal of Japanese Studies. And for quite a while, it was one of the most downloaded um, articles <laughs> that ever appeared in that journal. It was called Panic Sites. And people, it got people's attention. And as you, you may imagine, um, it took a very long time. And it's still, it's still not finished to get people to take anime seriously. And it's still a kind of a cross to bear. Uh, I still had problems. I mean, early on when I, I finally decided that somebody better write a book about it, and I waited around and nobody did, so I thought, okay, I will write a book. But, you know, the first 10 years or so was really pretty daunting because people would say, you're writing a book on Japanese cartoons? And be like, first of all, a book on cartoons? No way. And then a book on Japanese cartoons and and really people would look at me as if I'd grown a, a third head so but I persevered and because I thought I thought this is so interesting there's a vast amount of, of anime out there so I had to kind of figure out what was important what was worth talking about and there was so much there it was so rich and so 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 much material after all I find is that I do a book on Miyazaki who is you know almost certainly the greatest animator in the world today, and he happens to be a Japanese animator. And so that's been pretty much my life for the last, um, goodness, uh, is it almost 30 years now that I have been very much embroiled in anime. So it's really interesting because I did want to ask you if you've had, you know, difficulties establishing anime as an academic um, sort of subject, and I think you shared a little story about that. But I'm I'm listening to your stories, and I'm wondering you are able to see more than just the artistic surface of an anime. I think you are able to see a little deeper into anime. Um, you know, you mentioned the darkness of anime. Yes. Um, do you think your experience of living in Japan at such a young age, do you think that had anything to do with you to help you see that beyond just the imagery and beyond just the art, because you do need to understand the Japanese society mm-hmm. big time from an inside person to really understand that darkness. Wow, that's really interesting. No one's ever asked me that before. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I had many Japanese friends when I was there. And I also was, you know, part, I was living and taking part in the society. I wasn't, you know, hanging out with a bunch of other American teenagers. What I realized in dealing with Japan was how how little I did know about it and how I needed to kind of go on feeling, you know, going, looking under layer and layer and layer and seeing. I think I had always been able to, to not be worried about what people thought about my judgment I think my mother was also very important in this because she would do contemporary art. And, you know, she taught in the end, in her 70s, she was teaching something called the Radcliffe Seminars. Uh, This was um, a time when a lot of women were sort of coming back to the workforce or thinking about it after they would had children. And they would take her seminars on art history and they'd be very nice ladies from... um, you know, uh, it was Lexington or, or Concord or somewhere like that, you know, somewhere very nice. And they'd come in with their pearls and, and they would go to the museum and they would want to go see the Monets and they would see the Monets. But also my mother would insist that they look at contemporary art, pop art, um, ex- uh, early 20th century art, but sometimes really, really art that, that just was coming out of the 70s um and uh and 80s and they'd be like no 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 we want to see the monets and she said no you have to look at what society is doing now and that was tremendously inspiring for me animation can can seem vulgar um but i i really was willing to keep looking at it and and watching it looking at all different kinds of anime some of it was funny and some of it was vulgar. Some of it was absolutely exquisite and incredibly moving. There are, there are anime series that are so beautiful, uh, incredibly touching, uh, that absolutely, and, and one thing I do so appreciate is from the, I'm, I also interviewed many people about why they liked anime over the years, and these young Americans would say, because it reaches me, it, it's more real than Hollywood cinema. 
uh, they do talk about dark stuff. They do talk about sadness and uh, fear and depression and things like that. And sometimes it's expressed through these amazing animated images, but, but they're, they, they don't insist on the Hollywood happy ending. They don't insist on tying everything up with a ribbon. And I can relate to that. And I think it's true also, not just Americans, but I think of many uh, people out, out in the world that, that Hollywood doesn't necessarily always speak for people, that there is a, a desire to you know see that things don't, you know, things don't always end up perfectly and and what do you do then how do you keep on going and that's one reason why I like Miyazaki so much because I think he's very you know he's family friendly but his works are are complex works that, that don't give away give you easy answers I did a book in which I, I uh, spent quite a lot of a couple of years going to anime conventions and interviewing fans and that was one of the key things they said was they appreciated that there were no obvious villains often in anime that people could be could be multi-layered that could they could be complicated that they could have good good sides and bad sides and that you know again was was very reassuring because you don't always want to be in this this sort of black and white world uh, where you know it's one thing or another it's always a du duality but you know life isn't necessarily full of dualities it's it's lots of gray areas and certainly not just not just i but these people i was i was talking to these these anime fans are saying yeah they like the gray areas they they really appreciated that it, you know the nuances and i was just thinking could it be, you know how it, when you grow up in Japan, when you're a Japanese person in Japan, there are many sort of roles that you're supposed to play? I, I grew up with my parents always telling me that nails that stick up get hammered down. Mm -hmm. But when I went to college in the United States, I went to a women's college in the United States. So, you know, there was Yuko who... Um, was told by her friends, like, you need to step up, you need to advocate for yourself, you need to, you know, speak up and be more opinionated. And 14 hours later, just 14 hours on the plane later, I'm oh told you need to, you know, nails that stick out, um, get hammered down. That's an extreme example, but I think all of, a lot of Japan, um, a lot of people in Japan experience that, right? For instance, you are a sarariman, a businessman, and you're supposed to play a certain role when you're young, certain role when you're older. You are a housewife. You're supposed to play a certain role of being the model housewife. And I almost feel that that pressure mm -hmm. of really being your own self and yet maintaining harmony in that society kind of creates that sort of dual you know, there's no right and wrong. That's both me. Do you do you see any of that? Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't thought of it quite that way. But I think it does make sense that, yeah, because you're aware of just how, you know, honne and tatemaya, how you, how you appear to other people and your real self. And it's complex, whereas Americans are always like, well, I'm me and you got to take me for who I am. You made me think of something I, I gave a talk of couple of years ago at Tokyo University, Todai, on Mishima and Miyazaki. And um, one thing I was, I thought about when I was writing that talk was, it's also not just Mishima and Miyazaki, but people like Murakami, um, uh, Murakami Haruki, and you know, all these, in a way, I mean, all these really great creative people. And I thought, is it possibly because in Japan you had the nail sticking up, this gets hammered down, that almost in, in reaction to this, when people are creative, they are really creative. I mean, they are just really off the charts, exciting. Oh, and Murakami um, Takashi, the, the artist, this, you know, very interesting compartmentalized and hierarchical society, because there, when you when you get free of that in the creative world, you can suddenly just plumb in the depths of your psyche, reach down and, and just take out anything from your head and, and your soul and, and create these marvelous things. I'm actually thinking about Zen ink paintings, you know, from the 16th, 17th century. Those are often very crazy, very strange, grotesque even. Yeah, they, this. I mean, you think about Japan as a small country, but its art tradition is so amazing. It was almost like a yin and yang thing of the, the pressure and the conformity and the, you know, the co collectiveness and then the other side kind of expressing itself in this exceptional, you know, creative bursts of creativity. Susan, I have to ask you this question. If you were to step back, how do you think your connection to Japan have changed your life? 
Japan has meant so much to me. It's just meant so much. And it's, I mean, I think it's given me a new way of, of definitely a different approach to the world. I think one thing that's been very important is I've been always been interested in the environment. I did actually grow up partly on a farm. Um, and I think um, teaching Miyazaki and sort of getting into kind of Shintoism and uh, the sort of way um, people in Japan or traditionally have seen the connections with nature and the environment and humans in a very different way from the West. So that that's one way that I think I can see absolutely my, my whole worldview shifted. Um, but also just, I think, well, knowing that a place like Japan exists is also kind of important to me, that there is still a world of graciousness that even now, you know, I'll go into a coffee shop in Japan, there will be politeness and a kind of sense of, of a work ethic and, um, and just a, a kind of a world that is, you know, it definitely, Japan has its tremendous issues, but it still kind of works pretty well as a society. And, and knowing that Japan is there in a world that is so kind of chaotic and, and dark right now, I do see it as a kind of very, you know, special place. Um, I always think of um, uh, Miyazaki has this movie called um, Kazi no Tani no Naushika, or uh, Naushika, the Valley of the Wind, which is a great movie, but even greater is his manga that he wrote with it. It's a seven volume manga. And at the end of it, Naushika, his heroine, uh, is having this kind of big debate with, with someone um, about, uh, you know, what to, sort of the meaning of life, really. And he says to her, you know, life is light. And she said, and this is where the dark side comes in, yuka -san. Uh She says, no, life is a light that shines in the darkness. And to me, that's a very Japanese vision that, yes, there is darkness, but there is also light within there, and it still will, it can illuminate and be radiant and, and give us hope. Oh, wow, that's so beautiful, Susan. Oh, well, I hadn't expected to be asked anything like that, but yeah. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting their Japan journey? I would have to say start learning the language pretty quickly. <laughs> I mean, it is it is a difficult language. And I think um, also, you know, it's, it's um, if you possibly can, go there even going for a month or so. I mean, I have many students who just went for like, you know, six weeks or something, and they're still, they come back really quite transformed. They've, they've seen a way of life that, you know, yes, it's urban and it's modern, and in some ways it's westernized, but it's also different. And that is a very cool thing to learn uh, as part of your journey, just um, how many other cultures are out there. And if this culture works for you, it can be incredibly, um, and revitalizing and can give you a, a, a new way of looking at, at the world and, and life itself. Susan Napier, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. And hopefully more, many more journeys both for you and for everybody else who's in the U.S.-Japan journey. Many, many, yeah. many journeys to come. Support for My Japan Journey comes from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. To learn more about the Japan Society of Boston and our guest speakers, or to find the transcript of each episode, please visit our website at www.japansocietyboston.org forward slash podcast. My Japan Journey is produced by the Japan Society of Boston and edited by Lucy Jones. Our theme music is These Times by Blue Dot Sessions.